Hello everyone, this is Ross at Teacher Talk at the most influential blog on education in the UK. Today I am with Armand Dusha. Armand, uh, good afternoon. Uh, good morning. <laughs> oh, yeah, it's good morning for you, isn't it? Now, uh, for listeners, this is our second time uh, having a good conversation because I, 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 I did a few things uh, wrong with our first recording. Uh, tell us why it's good morning for, for you, Armand. You're over in Canada, aren't you? Which part? Yeah, I'm on the east coast of Canada, about a five-hour flight on the other side of the pond. Uh, it's a beautiful, sunny day. Uh, it's the end of the school year. It's and it's the a... end of the school year, yeah. So yeah. school's out. Yep, school's out, or close to it anyway. So uh, how long's vacation time uh, this time of year for you? Uh, it's usually eight weeks. Uh, well, around eight weeks. It takes mm -hmm. about three weeks to decompress, two weeks, yeah. and then you start thinking about the new year. So uh, it says eight weeks, but it's really about two. <laughs> and uh, we're recording during the pandemic and stuff. So what, um, what, what are the kind of plans for you to kind of switch off? Uh, we're still not like the UK. We're still in uh, lock, not necessarily full lockdown, but we can't travel between provinces yet. Uh, right. Getting my second shot soon enough, and uh, looking to discover a lot more of my region. Oftentimes, I'm I'm on a flight somewhere else around the world, and this yeah. is going to give me a chance to reconnect with uh, my own culture, which I think is going to be good. Yeah. Oh, well, I wish you all the best for a very relaxing summer holiday. Let's face it, all teachers need a, a good rest. Um, so for listeners, um, we connected, Armand, first uh, about the time when you were nominated for the Teacher Prize. Is that right? About three or four uh, years ago? Yeah, about three or four years ago. Yep. Uh, so give everyone a, a little insight into, you know, your kind of background, um, what you do today in the classroom. Uh well, my background as, as a young uh, teenager, I started coaching uh, football, soccer, uh, and uh, 25 years in, that brought me all over the world with our national program, Canada Games, which is a, uh, a national tournament for under 23s in this area, a bit like the FA Cup in some ways yeah. uh, for younger youth groups. Uh, university soccer, which is probably the highest level in the area, apart from professional. And uh, so that really formed sort of my... Uh, want to work with youth and then from there I actually had a career in sales and marketing with PepsiCo before kind of connecting with my values and beliefs and realizing you know what I I really should be in the classroom mm -hmm. and that was about 12 years ago uh, and since then it's been a wild journey uh, you know a lot of people say that the best years of your life are in high school and university I completely disregard uh, and uh, don't agree with that I think the best year of your life is always the next one uh, yeah. and that's pretty much what teaching has been for me it's been a, a wild journey uh, my first uh, teaching uh, contract was eight different courses uh, in middle right. school uh, I was teaching all sorts of things and it was really interesting. It was a baptism by fire. And then I moved into middle school and had a lot of success with cross-curricular, large-scale projects uh, that had international uh, recognition. Mm -hmm. And then from there, moved on to high school and I'm doing uh, modern history and world issues uh, and teaching social studies and, and having a wonderful time kind of... Uh, looking at that aspect of things with uh, my students. And, and since then, it's been five years of a lot of international travel, speaking, uh, mm -hmm. writing, uh, written a couple of books, uh, lots of different networks that I'm a part of that is really helping me grow. So mm -hmm. as much as I am a teacher, it's been mostly me as a student kind of learning as I go. And it, it's been a great journey. Yeah. Um, now, you, you, in terms of your subject specialism, uh, give us some insights here because you've had an interesting path haven't you, <laughs> in the classroom. Yeah, uh, I've got a bachelor's in kinesiology, uh, so I can teach sciences and uh, physical education, health sciences, all those kinds yeah. of things, and, and I have in the past. Uh, but I also have a minor in history, uh, so I teach social studies and so on. Uh, and with my experience uh, with these networks and working with UNESCO and the United Nations and all those aspects of things, uh, I also teach world issues. Uh, so it, it's been a, uh, it, I really have that connection between humanities, practical, uh, mm -hmm. and also research-based. So it's been quite interesting. 
and, and, and very broad. And I guess all the books and all your speaking gigs around the world, obviously with the pandemic, that's all gone to a halt. But I suspect you've been working online also the last 12 months? Uh, yes, I have, actually. We wrote uh, three different papers that have kind of led some of the changes during this pandemic and, and the upheaval. So the first one was thinking about pedagogy in an unfolding pandemic, which is really a foundational piece to uh many jurisdictions around the world on how they should mm -hmm. approach things particularly maslow before bloom really looking at the social emotional aspects the equity aspect uh how we can deliver it online uh, should it be track a track b you know at home and at school learning uh really looking at that full aspect and how to create partnerships so that was the first paper that we wrote um, I also wrote a children's book with a friend of mine called Hope, Where Are You? that was downloaded over 2 million times around the world, mm. uh, very much to bring out the aspect of our kids and how they were, what, what they were going through and giving mm -hmm. uh, parents and teachers a way to start the conversation with these kids and as, as it's happening. Um, also wrote a couple of other papers, uh, teacher leadership, what does it look like in the pandemic and, and a few other ones. So yeah, I've been doing a lot of writing, uh, in terms of webinars. Well, we yeah. started T4, uh, co-founded T4 with Vikas and yeah. Esteban Bullrich, uh, which was the largest ever online. I know I, I was, uh, privileged to be part of it. What, what an yeah. achievement that was. What a fantastic yeah. idea. Uh, what it was it? 80,000? People uh, 100, 120,000 for the first one was uh, incredible. Was how many we had? It was it was phenomenal, and uh, it really was the perfect timing and just the right people in place to kind of put it together with yeah. Vikas's expertise and education from a from a partnership and networking and, and vision point of view and and uh, my networks in terms of the professionals that we could bring in. Uh, it was yeah, really Vikas is, uh, he's got lots of ideas, doesn't he? Very off the wall, and uh, he always pulls them off somehow. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he does, and uh, it's, it's quite, it was quite incredible. So that that was something else we did during this period of time. And then I've been a part of, yeah, I, I'm thinking 50 plus webinars at this point, or facilitating right. sessions, uh, from uh, doing it for my local university to working with uh, UNESCO Education mm -hmm. International. OECD. So what? Uh, what, what what makes you tick and, and what are the things that you go hunting for that are kind of your fuel, your teacher fuel? Uh, the f I think the first one is that uh, I can always learn from the room. Uh, and I always consider the room smarter than me. And I think that's the first thing is I'm, I'm always digging. I'm always curious uh, mm -hmm. and I'm always willing to sit down and, and learn from anybody that's in front of me. Uh, and I think that's the basis of how I teach as well, is to build those relationships, to be able to figure out what makes them tick, to be able to help them move forward. Um, I think that's the first one. And I think the second one is really to try to leave a better place uh, for my children. And I know it mm -hmm. sounds corny, mm -hmm. uh, but money doesn't really matter to me. I'm, I'm in a good situation. I, I, I have a, a good life. Uh, you know, we, we're both working hard. We're middle class. Uh, you know, it's not that saying that money's uh, easily come by. I mean, we work mm -hmm. hard, but it's at the base of it. That's not what I value the most. What I value most is having an impact on my community and my community just seems to be getting a bit larger. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I know that feeling. Um, I, I want to zoom in on uh, the chapter that you contributed towards the Fourth Revolution book. Um, could you tell listeners a little bit more about your involvement in, in that particular book? Yeah, so uh, as a Global Teacher Prize nominee, we get together all the ambassadors. And the year that we got together, I had pitched to uh, the leadership of the Global Teacher Prize, which Vikas was part of at the time. Mm -hmm. um, I pitched the idea of putting a book together on how to approach education in the digital age, because there was already a book by Klaus Schwab, the World Economic Forum and Chairman, on uh, uh, the Fourth Industrial Revolution. However, there's a most of the people didn't really realize the impact of the fourth industrial revolution or that we were in the fourth industrial revolution, uh, you know, five, six years ago. Mm -hmm. So uh, as we're realizing all this disruption that coming in and the disruption that's going to have on the pillars of our democracy, uh, you know, judicial, legislative and executive, it's all mm -hmm. it's also going to have a major impact on the other two, which I would consider, which is media and education. Uh, which mm -hmm. are both foundational pieces to it. 
Uh, however, nobody was really talking about this disruption and how it was going to impact our classrooms and how uh, the digital age was really impacting the polarization, the social media, the trying to understand what its role was in education, its impact. And so we brought forward this book and I pitched the idea that why don't we take some of these teachers and put a book together uh, and really write about what does it mean to teach in this and to be forward thinking in, in terms of being in the rooms with policymakers, with politicians, with business, and having a real voice in how we're going to move education forward. Because as much as we think teachers are the ones driving education forward, there's many other partners in this, including the community, parents, business, politicians. And if we don't have a seat at the table, then the professionals don't actually have a voice. So we thought about this would be a book that we could really bring forward and within the context of the Global Teacher Prize and the, uh, the forum itself, it already had over 80 ministers of education there. So it, it really had a large impact and we knew it was going to have a large impact. So that's where we brought the book forward. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of contributing authors. Could you just name a few uh, different voices so people get a sense of uh, contributors? Yeah, so the first one would be uh, Yelmer Evers, obviously, who uh, most of your viewers would probably yeah. know through Flip the System, uh, very much about teacher empowerment and teachers driving the professional discourse. Uh, there's Michael Soskill, who uh, is a renowned teacher and author um, mm -hmm. in the U.S. There's also Nadia Lopez from the U.S., who mm -hmm. is a renowned principal, uh, also a teacher. And then we had Elisa Guerra, who's on the Futures of Education Commission uh, for UNESCO out of Mexico, uh, and uh, Kuhn Timmers, who runs uh, the global uh, the global learning for climate change and is a guru in his own right when it comes to digital learning. So mm -hmm. all these teachers came together, and uh, me being the co-lead to drive this forward. And my aspect was really from the classroom. So we had different aspects of the teaching profession and how it all comes together to try to give a, a, a really good vision of what's happening and what we think is going to happen in the future mm -hmm. and how to progress with it. So I'm gonna put you in the corner. Uh, you know, what would be your recommendations? What, what are your predictions in terms of this digital revolution that we're uh, currently I, going well, through and we're trying to navigate and work out what's happening? And I guess COVID's accelerated it in some shape or form, hasn't it? Yeah. I think the biggest issue that we have in education that we need to take care of is uh, to remember that it's a human endeavor and that the humanity really matters. Uh, in education, it's gotten so big and, and in many jurisdictions that, uh, and there's so many layers of leadership and so many layers of manager, managers, I should say, that we forget at the end of the day that it's about children. And the further mm -hmm. we remove ourselves from that decision making, uh, the further it just becomes numbers. And, and that's dangerous. Uh, and Simon Sinek writes beautifully about it in uh, Leaders Eat Last. Uh, but basically, it's that Milton Friedman mentality of how to deal with education. And I think a lot of cuts and a lot of, a lot of the decision making that has been made are made without understanding the stories behind why they were there in the first place. Mm -hmm. um, so that to me is the number one thing that we probably need to take care of moving forward is to remember that it, there's a human involved, it should be student centered, and that every context is different. Mm -hmm. You cannot copy paste, culture matters, religion matters, the community matters, and what's coming out of there is something that we need to take care of. And then you mm -hmm. also have a, a complete reform of the system from an equity-based point uh, that I think we are struggling with and trying to understand how this works and how do we approach it. Uh, so so in that context, what are the current challenges uh, in your province, I suppose, if we narrow it down rather than looking at globally? What, what are the current issues for Canadian teachers or at least in your, uh, uh, your part of the world? I think it comes down to the same thing across jurisdictions, actually, Ross, right. even if it was just my province. Um, I think the first one is very much struggling with uh, where do we go from here? There's been so much turmoil and uh, so many different ideas coming forward and so many different uh, elements in play 
and the polarization of politics and, and the way that we talk to each other, that it, it's really about resetting our, our not GPS, but our, our compass and, and trying to figure out, okay, where is North? And mm -hmm. where is North for everybody in an inclusive environment, not where is North for just one group of the population. And why do I say that this is one of the issues around the world is because our cities are multicultural now. And, mm -hmm. and it doesn't matter how big you are or how small you are. It very is multicultural, multi-ethnicity, multi multi-religious. Uh, and that wasn't the case 30 years ago in most countries, mm -hmm. right? You might've had three or four families max uh, mm -hmm. in bigger cities. Yes, it was the case like London, but for most of the smaller areas, it wasn't. Now it is. And mm -hmm. that needs a different approach. Uh, you need to be empathetic. You need to be able to build relationships. You need to be able to understand uh, multiple languages actually, and how to communicate and create partnerships with those parents to be able to help those children. So. I think that's something that we are all struggling with at the moment and to try to figure out, okay, how do I do this? How do I keep learning? What are the professional development mm -hmm. platforms that we need to develop for our, mm -hmm. our, our teachers? Uh, there's so yeah. many elements that come into play. Here in, here in England, uh, we've got a big, quite rightly, a big focus on, you know, curriculum reform, uh, inclusivity, diversity, uh, you know, rather than, you know, your, your traditional textbooks are a lot more role models uh, that are referenced, which is a good thing. Um, I want to switch to some practical advice for teachers, Armand. You know, workload's an issue. We know those problems that we all have are ubiquitous, like you mentioned, uh, for all of us, regardless of where we are. Um, in my experiences, marking is always a pain in the backside for all teachers. So if we just start on that one issue and then we'll pick up one that is important to you, what, what, what are your kind of issues with marking uh, and any recommendations? So marking for me is it splits in between two. Um, you have the teachers that are kind of, not kind of, you have the teachers that are really uh, attached to the standardized testing. And, and the marking is then attached to that standardized test that's coming through. Um, and I think that's a different type of marking and it's a different type of feedback that you're giving to students than the ones that can go student centered and are not attached to a standardized test at the end of the year. Mm -hmm. uh, so when it comes to marking for me, uh, I always try to create uh, whatever rubric that we're working uh, is to co-plan it with students. Uh, and marking for me is not a elimination process. Like you got this wrong, you got this wrong, you got this wrong, so this is your mark. To me, it's a, you are going to gain this by doing this. So mm -hmm. the process and the journey is different. Uh, and what do I mean by that is if I'm doing a, a project with, or if a child is doing a project, I'm with that child every step of the way and the goal of that project is to reiterate numerous times whatever they're trying to create, be it an academic piece, be it a creative piece, be it a uh, oral presentation. So the goal for me is not to see it at the end and then give it a mark. Yeah. My goal is to be with them and help them and coach them and give them uh, uh, some critical feedback throughout and see them improve because that's really what the process is when you're in the real world, right? Mm -hmm. You're reiterating numerous times before you actually give something. And if you're not, you're doing, you're not doing yourself justice because the more impact, the better it's going to become, the more voices that mm -hmm. are actually coming into play and giving you some critical feedback and reflection and so on. So now, to me, it's I, always about gaining. Sure. Now I want to pick up on the point you made about co-planning. Uh, You'll have a, a group of, you know, that polarization point. Some teachers think the teacher is the expert. Other people believe that the students have a, should have a say in their learning. What, what are your views on particularly this student's code creating uh, the, the rubric? Well, <laughs> the funny thing is that I think the pendulum shifts on one side or the other. And, and we talked about it a bit. The voices become very polarized, particularly on Twitter. And uh, there, there's always an 
equilibrium somewhere is that you need to balance out. And sometimes it's more teacher led, sometimes it's more student led, but there, mm -hmm. there's a balance there, right? And it's not just one side, but oftentimes when the decisions come down and you need to implement something, it's like, oh, pendulum shifted all the way to that side. And then all yeah. of a sudden it shifts all the way to the other. So um, I, I do believe that teachers need to have an expertise and there are subject expertise, they're definitely there. And you are what I would call the vision uh, and the connector for that classroom. So the child has a voice and the child should express that voice and be able to negotiate with you and talk with you and communicate. Mm -hmm. But the child doesn't know what it doesn't know, right? So let's say you're interested in frogs and you're a 12 year old. I am and... actually, cause I've just got tadpoles in my, uh, <laughs> my new pond, but I actually don't know what to do or what's gonna happen. So like in, in this situation, if that's an interest and I can connect the curriculum to you, then I am the expert. I know what my curriculum talks about. And maybe it talks. Are about you a frog stuff. expert? Because I actually no, I need that. <laughs> fully not, fully not. Oh, I just thought about I frogs. I don't know why. <laughs> uh, but, but in that sense, like if I know you like frogs and I need to teach ecosystems, this is where me as the teacher expert understands that ecosystem frogs go hand in hand. Yeah. Now you feel like I'm, you're leading this, but I also know where you're going. Yeah, you're so connecting I know that, that I real... need to find, right? I need to yeah. find an expert that can connect you to that ecosystem. Maybe you can talk to, or maybe I can talk to you about, okay, you like frogs. I need ecosystems. Can you produce a video on I think, you know, frogs? yeah, we talked offline that, you know, we're talking about the book that you're writing and the one that I'm researching and writing about. Uh, so my one on memory, that, that episodic experience, the personal event, the frog, the semantic, you've got the concepts, rules and facts about the ecosystem, then that's where that connection, uh, I think, uh, you're referencing in the classroom. Yeah, it, it's exactly that. And, and at the end of the day, that's where I need to let go of it. So where my test might be about certain elements of the ecosystem that at year in and year out, they need to understand, that's fine, but that shouldn't be the 100% of my mark. The other, mm -hmm. I can do that for 20%. The other 80% can really be driven by the student and really get them interested about science and yeah. about frogs and about ecosystems based off the fact that, okay, this is a foundational piece you got to do. And to be able to do this, we're going to put this in your project. Sure. This is going to be the third part of it. You're going to do research. We're going to talk about it. We're going to do. And, and then by the time they've done it, you've let go a bit of 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 your uh, power in the classroom and you've given it to the child to really embrace it and to push forward and to question and to to reframe it and and mm -hmm. to me that's where that collaboration comes in so it's not necessarily you are the teacher expert yeah you are i mean you've gone to university you've got a degree you've got an expertise in the subject matter uh and and what that gives you is the ability to empower others it's not to take that power and make yourself the sage on the stage and you are all powerful, almighty Dumbledore mm -hmm. or, or I actually Gondolf would probably be the best reference <laughs> from Lord of the Rings. It, it's about you being able to share that power and, and, sure. and for them to feel empowered. And I think that's where we, we lose it a bit. And I think that standardized testing culture has, has, has driven that as well. Uh, where you feel you need to, you feel like you mm -hmm. can't let go of that because otherwise you're going to be questioned. Now, um, so I use marking as an example. What what would be your workload problem, the greatest uh, burden of people around you that you work with? I, I I honestly think it's the it's the demands on your time that are not taken into account. So the administrative duties that are now far more uh, demanding and far more reaching than it was at one point. Mm -hmm. uh, and it, it's oftentimes to, uh, it's busy work is what I would call it. Uh, mm -hmm. It doesn't come down to what's the most important, which is the kid and its learning. It's about, mm -hmm. you know, filling some, checking somebody else's checkbox. Yeah. And it's not about checking the checkbox of people in front of you. Uh, I think that managerial aspect of things, and, and really, it's, it's really a capitalistic drive of Milton Freeman's way of managing, uh, which is, 
I think really sucking the life out of the profession in many ways. Uh, I don't know if it's the same in the UK, but I feel that oftentimes we're not trusted as professionals and we are professionals. It's not a check-in, yeah, check-out. Yeah, well, uh, you know, going back to your point on Jelma Evers and autonomy and stuff, it's uh, in England teachers will say trust is the number one thing that they they want that autonomy and... You know, you do your research into kind of anything, PISA, OECD, whatever, and you look at England in comparison to other uh, kind of countries, we have one of the lowest autonomies in the world. This, you know, but one or two teachers will say, well, well I don't. I, I, I feel very free. And you'll get that in pockets. But on the whole, in terms of academic research, uh, it's a real burden for teachers. And I think that, you know, m my life as a school leader and thinking about the check boxes and the boxes for the boxes and all those kind of things that are evidence gathering evaluations rather than what difference will this make to a child tomorrow and is it making the life of a teacher easier that's a question we should all be asking all of the time um i just want to shift um to a kind of uh, a focus on just some general insights from COVID, from your webinar experiences, just to kind of finish, I suppose, is you know, what, what kind of messages have you heard from teachers around the world that you've been working with? You know, the struggles, the kind of maybe the, the positive things that have come as a result of working online, you know, that kind of s switching to work a little differently, the new technologies that have emerged. Yeah. So, uh, well, I can talk flavor. to you about the two, the two struggles um uh, one is being unheard uh many teachers all over are feeling unheard uh and disregarded in the decision making process i think that's one thing that we're hearing a lot of mm -hmm. even in the areas where it's working really well uh it, it feels oftentimes like your your voice is is being drowned out by the crowd and, and your professional input is not being asked for. So I think that's one thing. Uh, the second biggest struggle, I believe, is the day-to-day -day impact of our the decision-making from our leaders. And I'm not talking school leaders here, I'm talking about politicians and our healthcare and so on, and how every decision that was made that impacted classrooms really disrupted our abilities to uh, deliver a, a, a really good education to our children. And what do I mean by that is that every time they made changes to the operational plan mm -hmm. or any time that they made changes on, on the fly or that they would put something forward and then take it away, well, a lot of these leaders, they're not day-to-day -day leaders. They're not the ones that manage that day-to-day -day that a school leader would do, right? Mm -hmm. So I don't think they understood how much of an impact that had on the day-to-day -day lives of mm -hmm. teachers and the ability to deliver to their students and create some sort of safety net for their students as we sure. move forward. So some I think positives. that was, yeah, that was a major struggle. Uh, yeah. In terms of positive, uh, the professional learning community, I think we finally hit kind of a nirvana there where people were sharing all over the world uh you had an expert in something you could reach out to i yeah. think there was a really willingness to dive in and trust our professional colleagues and, and and really connect with each other uh to do what's best for students i think that was number one uh just that that whole explosion in march april may and yeah. that professional learning and that networking. I think you you went through it as well. I think that well, was Well, you know, I, 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 apart from us all, you know, the initial shock and then having to adapt to a new way of working, you know, just general insights on my website, my, my statistics, you know, people, teachers searching for resources uh, doubled overnight. Yeah, I think it was pushing yeah. half a million uh, hits uh, in yeah. April last year. Um, so, Amand, uh, We've done this before, actually. So, uh, but I'm going to remind you when we get uh, past the 25 minute barrier, I throw a little kind of quick fire questions at you, and uh, no pause or hesitate. And I'm going to see if I can catch you out. But we'll kind of do a little kind of whistle stop synopsis of all the things we've discussed. So, uh, I guess it, you know, post pandemic virus, etc. If I came over to your part of the world, what would we do? Where would we uh, go? 
probably watch a Liverpool game because I'm a massive fan. <laughs> Well, there you go. I'm, I'm an Everton fan, believe it or not. So uh, we'll, we'll go to a derby. We'll probably um, watch the derby. <laughs> so uh, school's out today for you. What's the first thing you're doing tonight? Uh, probably bringing my wife to a great restaurant to thank her for her patience and support throughout the pandemic. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, what are your? Um, how, how do you look after yourself, well-being wise? Uh, I've really reframed it over the last eight weeks, actually. And I get up really early around four o'clock. I do some journaling, uh, have a nice coffee, do some reading, mm -hmm. writing, and then jump on the bike and do some training. What's the one thing you need to be better at? Present. Uh, I am always thinking about what's next, what's next, what's next. Okay. And I don't, well, the I next don't question is, uh, what, what project are you working on? So I won't say necessarily today cause it's your day <laughs> off, but, um, What's on your table? Um, uh, I am co-leading a grade nine program that's really looking at uh, how do we reframe and help the, those kids in their first year of secondary really get a foundation mm -hmm. for the future. I've got two books on the go. And apart from that, trying to get back into Ironman shape. All right. Fantastic. Um, what piece of advice for a teacher who wants to try Twitter, but it's a bit cautious? Uh, my piece of advice is try to follow uh, all sorts of different elements in education. If you want to jump into the conversation, be curious uh, and be positive. Uh, and don't let yourself uh, go down the rabbit hole of negativity that oftentimes appears on Twitter. Amen. Uh, what would be your piece of advice for a teacher wanting to write a book? Uh, that's a great question. I think it's about sitting down and it's really about reflection and really looking at your practice and why do you want to write it? And if it helps you reflect on things and move forward and improve and connect with people and gain more expertise, then it's the right reason to write a book. If you want to be a sage on the stage and profess something, then it's not the right reason. Sure. Uh, are you a better science PE or history teacher? uh <laughs> that's a great question <laughs> uh honestly i don't think the subject really matters i think my role is very much to connect with kids with whatever the subject is and i think i do a decent job of that uh am i yeah. the best person in the building probably not uh but i try to improve every year what's your uh, go-to app on your mobile phone spotify <laughs> spotify okay um <laughs> Uh, mark, your favorite marking technique to reduce that time, uh, you know, whether it's written or verbal, what is it? Uh, I don't really have one for us, to be honest with you. Uh, a lot of it is uh, co-marking with students uh, mm -hmm. or with colleagues uh, because we do a lot of co-teaching. Okay, uh, sure. Who would you recommend I interview next and why? Who would I? Re That's a great question. Andy Hargraves is always fun. Uh, yeah, well, I've done Andy, so give me another one. I love Andy. Okay. Uh, I think Nadia Lopez has okay. a, a really good voice at the moment. And, well, she always had does. And her uh, capacity to reflect on things and to bring forward the equity piece and the inclusive piece, I think, is uh, somebody that you should be interviewing. Right. Nadia, I'll write that down. If you had 30 seconds with one of your Canadian MPs, what would you say? 30 seconds, go. That we need to invest in children in the same way that we invest in everything else and that we need to give them the best possible chance at being a contributing member of society and that they see that and that we need to model that. Meaning if we need to give three meals a day for the kids that don't have that, then, then we should be doing that. If we need to give free university so that we can move forward or free college or vocational, so that mm -hmm. they can see something going forward. I think that we need to support them so that they don't get in debt way too early and they can be contributing members to society. Fantastic. Um, I'm going to assume you're doing your dream job, and if it wasn't, it would be playing for Liverpool. But what's your uh, wacky career you never had? <laughs> wacky career I never had? Uh, like your, dream, uh, your dream job, you know, that kind of, you know, 10 I'm, year I'm, old I'm, dream. I'm, I'm, I'm doing it, I think. Uh, but it would probably be, uh, you're right, it would probably be my Liverpool career. And I would love to be a one year internship with Jurgen Klopp. I think I would learn a lot about oh, how to create the right culture. 
What would be your advice to your 16-year-old self? Be curious. Okay. Uh, biggest uh, career achievement? <sighs> biggest career achievement? Oh, not biggest. Uh, one that you uh, like, uh, you know, let's do a show off. What, what are you most proud of? I, I think, uh, honestly, it's being able to connect with people all over the world and learn from them. Mm-hmm. Where, where can listeners find out more about you? Uh, my LinkedIn or my Twitter account, probably. Uh, okay. would probably be the best to bet. Yeah. And my last question, Armand, um, what would you have? What's your legacy? What do you want to be your legacy? Uh, I'm hoping my legacy is that I been able to give the foundation to hundreds of thousands of students and teachers that we can move forward in an inclusive, sustainable world. Fantastic. So there you go. And one last thing, Armin, could you just uh, shout out that, that, that book you wrote during the pandemic, the hope one? Uh, yeah. So hope, where are you? It's on Twitter as well. It's free in over 50 languages, uh, at hope, where are you.com. Fantastic. And uh, so it's pushed 2 million downloads, I believe, or something. Yeah, it's pushed over 2 million downloads, and we gave away the creative uh, licensing. So you can also code. Uh, you can code your own story. There's all sorts of things going on with right, it. Brilliant. Yeah. yeah. Right, Armand, it's, uh, it's you know second time lucky. Uh, thank you. And, and uh, lucky you, summer holidays. I'm looking forward to it. <laughs> thank you, Ross. I really right, appreciate it. Catch up talking. soon. Yeah, look after yourself. Speak to you soon.